Welcome to another episode of Conversations with Cupid. I'm your host, Marla Martinson, and we're going to talk writing today with Kira Davis. Hey, Kira. Hi. <laughs> best-selling author. She is a New York Times and USA Today best-selling author of the Just One Night Pure Sin and Sophie Cat series, as well as So Much for My Happy Ending and Just One Night, which has been optioned for television. Yay! Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's exciting. It's really, really exciting. <laughs> and before publishing her first book, which is my favorite, because that's the first one I've read, was Sex, Murder, and a Double Latte back in yeah. 2005. And I love my vanilla soy latte, so I would drink my <laughs> vanilla soy latte and read the Sophie Cat series. There um, you go. So you guys, I want to talk about kind of, you know, Kira wasn't always a best-selling author, New York Times. She supported herself and her son as a marketing manager for a sports club. Before that, a department manager at Nordstrom's Savvy Department, whatever that is, Savvy. Yeah. <laughs> she studied at the Fashion Institute and, and studied merchandising, so she wasn't always uh, this big-time author. And, I you know, I have a lot of girlfriends now that are really making it big and I've known them for a few years. I think, you know, you and I have known each other for maybe six, five or six years now. Yeah. And I remember uh, having lunch with you and you were considering, you know, what should I do with the, the Sophie Katz series? Should I self-publish now? Should I, what should I do? And you were like kind of struggling and looking for maybe another job. So, and then all of a sudden it was like, whoa, it turned around. So just speak to us that. about the writers that like are frustrated. They're maybe even trying to write one book or maybe think, you know, this isn't going to happen. It's just, I can't do it. So what's right. your, what's your staying power and how did you do this? Well, I think that the stories you always hear about writing are the JK Rowling stories. You know, I came from nothing and then I wrote my book and my book took off and I became rich and famous and wonderful. And that is a Cinderella story. But that is also the major exception. Usually your debut novel is not the one that launches you into success. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't work that way 95% of the time. I'm going to say 99% of the time. Point nine. <laughs> and, exactly, right. And because we don't hear that narrative of having to slowly work your way up, it can be really discouraging when your first, your second, your third book doesn't have you on the New York Times bestseller list, you know, because you're sitting there thinking, but this is not the success stories that I've heard, and therefore I'm not a success story, and I won't be a success story. And it's very hard to get over that mentality. Um, it's hard to see a track upward. Um, but for me, just one night came out, Ten years after my um, after I started writing, so Sex Murder Double Latte came out in two thousand five, but that means I started writing beforehand, right? right? Yeah. So I started writing. You know, it's like you have probably took me two years to write that book because I was trying to figure out what I was doing, and then a year from the time I sold it to publication. So yeah, it was about ten years when Just One Night came out, and I sold it for nothing. I mean, I sold. The, I mean, I. I, I sold the um, the rights to Simon Schuster, the advance that you get for nothing. And you know, after all that time, I was sort of thinking, I have to be realistic. You know, I have some really strong fans, but um, but I haven't made it so far, and I do have a son, and um, and I was a single mother at the time, and you know, I, I had. There was school. It was you know you need to go to a private school for various reasons, and then there's college. Come on, you know. So I did think in that way. I mean, I'm not going to say that that didn't go through my mind, but there was a part of me that just wasn't willing to fully accept that. And forever ago, I read this. I want to say that I am generally speaking a cynic by nature. Okay, I am, and yet I think. All of us kind of want to believe a little bit in magic, and and I do see the value in positive thinking because right. when you're thinking positively, you're looking for opportunity. Whereas if you're thinking negatively, you're not, and so you don't recognize the opportunities when they're in front of you because you're not expecting to see them. And 
So I read this book by Scott Adams, right, the cartoonist, and at the very end of that book, he had written this little segment about how he writes his what he wants for himself 15 times over again every day. I, Scott Adams, will be a number one cartoonist, right? You know, and and how that has worked for him over and over and over again. And it's not like you just write it and then say, okay, do your magic, right? You write it to kind of help you focus on what your goal is, to really cement it in your mind and say, this is what is going to happen. Not I, Kira Davis, would like or want. Right. I, Kira Davis, will. And so... Or am. I am a best-selling author, right? In the right. Kind of I mean, anchoring it, right? In this case, it was, yeah. In this case, it was Will. It's like, this, okay. I'm going to achieve okay. this. Okay. I will. Like a concrete and, goal that you're putting down. Right, exactly. I will by this time, you know, in yeah. this year. So, um, and I was doing that every day. I was doing that even as I was, you know, interviewing to sell cars and such like that. Even as I was doing all that, I was still writing that every day on my lunch break, whatever, you know, and cause I did. I took a job selling Lexus. I mean, I was just pretty desperate at that time. And I wrote every spare second that I had, and I did sell um, just one night, again, for very little money, um, to Simon & Schuster, mm -hmm. and nobody was expecting this book to really take off. Mm -hmm. um, I did put you know, a lot into it, I really cared about that book, but no one was expecting it to take off. There was no big marketing budget behind it, nothing. There now, was is just one night the erotica? Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Yeah. Because you, so you guys, she had this amazing Sophie Cat series, which was like a, a, a kind of a chick lit type of a detective, you know, uh, stories right. that, that the same character in San Francisco, and it was really fun and cute. And, but then didn't they approach you to do this erotic stuff? Yeah, so I had worked with this editor um, for the Sophie Cat series. When I, I wrote that for. Red Dress Inc., which was owned by Harlequin, then Red Dress Inc. went under, and I moved to Mira, but anyways. Uh, so, so one of my editors from there had moved to Simon & Schuster, mm -hmm. and I had had a good relationship with him. Um, he did ask me if I would be interested in writing an erotic romance. And, and that was on the tales of, uh, uh, what was the, that big one that, it, you know, that was self-published and then... Fifty Shades of Grey. Fifty Shades of Grey. It was right after that. Every, they wanted all these erotica stuff. That's Everybody. why, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, I, I wrote something that did not really fit the mold so well of that genre, but it was true for me. I mean, it was like, it's what I wanted to say for that genre, you know? And I got a tiny little bit of pushback, like, you know, this might be a little controversial for these readers. It's like, yeah, but no, 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 it'll be fine. Right? <laughs> and I think, and it was controversial, it turns out much more than I anticipated, but, you know, controversy reads conversation, which frequently breeds sales. So, um, so what they did is they said, I mean, I negotiated that deal and by the end of it, they had said, okay, well, if we're going to do this, we want it in three parts. We want you to do three, e um, three novellas and then later we'll go to paperback, um, after some time, right? But first we're going to do three ebook novellas and then we'll put it together in the paperback later. And, you know, fine. <laughs> I was like, so that's what I did. They, I had one benefit um, in that they put an ad in the back of a book that had they had had a lot of hype around. Um, it was a Twilight fan fiction gone to you oh, know. Oh, okay. Right? Those were very it. Big, so it right? had eyes on yours. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So I got an ad in the back of that, and that gave me a little bump. Mm -hmm. But what happened with that book is more than any book I've ever written. It just was a word of mouth thing. I mean, it gave me a bump, and then the sales number started to go down, and then people started talking about it, and it started to go up. It started to go up. I mean, that book came out in January, and I made the New York Times bestseller list in March. So it wasn't like, you know, this wasn't like boom. And, and that was just for Kindle. I mean, that was ebook. Oh, right, yeah, exactly, so exactly. But by the time the second one came out, mm -hmm. um, because again, it was they set it up as a trilogy, so there was a two. Um, it was an ebook, but it sold so many copies that I made the number three spot in the combined um, paperback ebook 
print combined on the New York Times bestseller list because that's what they do. They say, okay, so if you look at all the numbers together, mm -hmm. where are you on this list, right? And I didn't even have a paperback to contribute to that number at the time, and I still was able to get it to number three, you know? Wow. I mean, I, it was, I mean, it took everyone by surprise. It took everyone by storm. I didn't follow any of the rules that you're supposed to follow. I didn't even, for this genre, know the rules you were supposed to yeah, follow. Yeah, because I remember having lunch with you, and you said, oh, I've been asked to write erotica, and, you know, we, you can thank it to Fifty Shades of Grey, because if it wasn't for that big hit, you wouldn't have been asked to write this, and so that, even people say, oh, that wasn't well written, and I can't believe it made it, and da, da, da. But, but it opened doors. I know some other, I know Megan Crane started doing uh, erotica, Harlow, I don't know, real harlequin romance types but i think more a little more erotic under caitlin cruz and all of that it really started you know opening up a lot a rising tide lifts all boats you know i mean yeah. it's like it that's just how it works so yeah. you can regardless of what you think of 50 shades which i know is also a very divisive book right. um regardless of what you think of you love it you hate it you cannot deny mm -hmm. what it has done financially for the publishing publishing industry or what it has done for the romance genre in general right. because Fifty Shades was another book that broke all sorts of rules and again you could say that it did it well or not that's a totally different discussion but it yeah. broke rules yes. and romance was a genre all about rules there were words you couldn't say there were things you couldn't do all this stuff went out the window with the success of that book so when I came out with this book that also was very different for the genre. Yeah, I got a little pushback, but not anywhere near as much. You know, they still put it out. I couldn't have gotten it published before because they would have said, oh, I don't know, she's a little too edgy. You know, there's some, um, you know, the, the, I don't have this virginal or in any way innocent heroine, you know, and, um, they were, you know, that was, that was a little touchy, but they were like, okay, let's do it. And, yeah. And it worked. I mean, and it didn't just work here. It, you know, it's been on the top of the you know the list in Mexico, in Spain, in um, in England to a slightly lesser degree, but in Italy. I mean, it's like this book really has taken off in Russia. I mean, and Russia is a place where they're not supposed to. I mean, really, they should be reading that maybe. <laughs> You know, so it's like, because they really do have censors there. But now let's get it into the Middle East. <laughs> exactly, right? Get but, a fatwa out on you, you know, oh no. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, so it, it really, it changed everything. It was really, you know, I went from this place where thinking, I don't know how I'm going to make it, how I'm going to continue to be able to pay rent on my little apartment yes. to all of a sudden, like, having my publisher literally greet me with champagne when I walked into the office and, you know, and I, it's just, right, it's a whole different ball game. And, you know, I could say it happened overnight, but it took 10 years 10 to get years, there. Yeah, so, so everybody, there, our point here is to not give up and not, and I think you, you weren't, I mean, you wrote because you loved to write. It wasn't like I have to be a, I mean, you did put your goal, I want to be a New York Times bestselling author, but it wasn't like, you know, your whole being was just to be rich and famous. It was the love of the craft and the storytelling, and that's what you really got to do because, like you said, it's such a small amount of people who really do make a living writing or yeah. make it that you really have to yeah. enjoy what you're doing. Otherwise, you know, it's just... It's 100% true. But I will also say this. I do believe that people are much less likely to become financially successful doing something that they don't have a passion for mm -hmm. than going for the outlier, the one that, even if it, even if it is a career that, you know, you, most people don't make much money at, if that's where your passion is. Yes more likely to be successful. Though. Right, right. You weren't so. passionate about selling Lexus cars, but you probably could have made a lot of no. money. <laughs> I don't know, because I wasn't doing so well. <laughs> they, Because know, you weren't passionate. Me. You weren't passionate about it. Right, exactly, exactly. I just, I don't know. <laughs> and then, you know, t you said that, so you had a son who, you know, t took a lot, of, takes a lot of time, and then you have the job, you had to pay the bills, and then you said you wrote every chance you got, and that yeah. consistency is, 
is the key. Um, would you say even if somebody would write, because people would ask me, like, I'm writing my fifth book right now, and, you know, I'm not on a bestseller list yet, but I keep, you know, it's, it's so exciting. Every time a new one comes out, I'm super excited about this new one because it's different than any of my other ones. But people will say, oh, how, I have a uh, idea for a book. I want to write a book, but they won't even start it because I think a lot of people think I don't have any time. But I'm just as busy as anybody. I've got a husband, a dog, a house, a full-time uh, business to run. But even if you put, I tell them, if you do one page a day at the end of the year, you'll have a whole book. Or one page every three days. It's absolutely true. And you know, I, I, I want to, people don't realize this about, um, I didn't realize this about car sales, but this kind of kind of goes into the time thing. Um, most cars, if you're selling cars, you usually get one day off a week. Mm. I want to say that again, one day off a week, okay? And you're working usually about 10 hour days. It's, I, I didn't quite realize how just comprehend I mean it's just you and only it's paid if you make a sale right there's no salary right. <laughs> well they have they have to give you a minimum but you have if you're not making sales then yeah. you're not going to keep the job right so it's like you need to make your money from your commissions because if you're making just the minimum which you and it's basically pretty close to minimum you're screwed right yeah. so <laughs> yeah so it's an enormous time commitment and I did and I will say this, is that I did for that summer, you know, I, I did send um, my son to see his grandparents, right? But even so, every break, every break, I was writing my book. You know, you get an hour break. And I realized some people don't take it. I took the hour, I wrote my book. You know, I, I got up, if it meant I had, you know, I got up at 6 in the morning to do a workout. I would go to, the, um, go to work. I'd write on, you know, on my break, I'd come home, I'd write at night, and then I'd get up and do it again. You know, you don't, every minute counts if that's mm -hmm. what's important. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, you know, when I wrote Sex, Murder, and Double Latte, which was my first book, it was pretty similar experience, you know? I mean, if, you know, my, I'm waiting for my son on some appointment and I'm out there writing a book, you know? Wow. If I have to take a plane trip somewhere, you're writing your book. And I love airplanes for writing. I do that too. I open up my laptop and yeah. you've got, you know, two hours or five hours to just, it's, that's the best, writing on a plane. <laughs> exactly. You know, I mean, and it's, it's hard. I'm not going to say it's easy and I'm not going to say that it doesn't take longer that way because it does. Mm -hmm. um, but to say that I haven't written my, I'm not writing because I don't have time Nobody has time until they make it, you know, yeah, and you exactly. can't make it. Just the time you're, now, we're, we're sitting on Facebook checking in or something, you know, if you just turn that off right. and say, what, you know, what, one day a week, no Facebook or whatever, and, and put, say, I'm going right. to spend that. I bet we fritter away, you know, an hour a day or more on that. You don't realize. And I, I don't think, I do think it's gotten harder to find time because we have, social networks and our emails and everything on our phones and our hands at all times so that we're constantly being inundated with stuff that we need to respond to. And I say need yeah. in the present because we don't really, we don't really, it feels like, I know the little ding, I know that when someone says something to you on Twitter, you really want to respond right now, but you don't have to. Okay. People are always so shocked. They're, they're like, Marla, you, you respond so fast. I, I, I can't believe this. And I'm like, yeah, well, I'm just, I'm here all day at my computer working, making right. matches or writing or doing the interviews. Right. So I'm really here unless I'm walking the dog or going to the gym. And uh, so, yeah, I, I just respond right away. And, I, I'm, and then right. they're like, wow, people are shocked. Yeah, it's true. It's like, true. I, I know. To. I always sometimes I'll wait just because I don't want to be embarrassing. Like, okay, they just I don't want to respond within seconds. <laughs> and then if I don't, I think I'm mad at them. Like, oh, you didn't respond yesterday, so are you mad at me? It's like, no, right. no, I just right. you know was laying down. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So you know, good. So so this is awesome. I mean, and then do you have a favorite ritual? Do you drink tea? Do you play any music? Do you like to be in a certain room? What What's your favorite way to write if you can? I need to be, it's hard for, to get into a creative mindset when you're doing something else. Like if you're doing like, whether it's social media or selling cards or, or, you know, dealing with something with your son's school, whatever. So you have to do that switch um, where you kind of go from this world to a completely other world. And you have to be completely lost in that other world in a second. Um, for me, 
one of the ways I kind of change my mindset is to read a passage from a favorite book, um, even you know just a few pages, something that I find creatively inspiring. An, art, an author who I think is someone like, wow, she really has something to say, and she's or he or she is saying it in a way that I feel I could really learn from. I love the way they use their prose. I'll read a few pages there, and then I start writing. And that's really important to me because reading, I think, reading and writing are, are parallel things. They're, they're so, you know, they go hand in hand. And when you get yourself in the fictional world, of any fictional world, it's easier to go to the next one um, than going from balancing your checkbook to going into a creative right, place. true. Yeah, making that transition. So, and what's interesting is, so I find a lot of people who are, who are writing uh, fiction, they'll be... Uh, the characters will be a lot like themselves, like my friend Anjali Banerjee. She writes, you know, her characters are Indian because she's East right. Indian background. And you have, I think Sophie Katz was, you're half black, half Jewish, right? And and the, right. she was too. And, and I think we take a lot from our own lives. Now this, the erotica though. <laughs> Not at all. Yeah. But, yeah. It was very, I mean, it's interesting. People tend to look down on romance and I and I do under I understand that tendency because it's um, it's a saturated market and anytime you have a saturated market this is a popular thing to say but there are a lot of poor quality books out there there just are you know and so if you've only picked up a few and you're like this is really bad I understand the tendency to kind of generalize and say the whole genre must be um, but I've really found that I've been able to really stretch myself and challenge myself as an author within the romance genre, mm -hmm. um, which is not to say that I'm going to stay there forever. I'm not, but I, because, you know, it's like, these are the confines you know, you have, it has to be about a relationship. And I had never really written a book that was centered on that idea in quite this way. And I really wanted to add my own creativity and my own strifes and interests, you know, in terms of these characters. And I created characters who were so different from me, but I really fell in love with. I mean, with just one night, these characters were so different from me. And, um, and it was really wonderful writing them. Um, I don't think I could have started there. I don't, you know, I, I think I had to start with something a little bit closer to home. Um, it seems like and, that's what most people, most writers do, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. I, and I think you, you know, if you look at books like very popular women's fiction author is Jennifer Weiner, and her yep. first book is good and really bad. Close it was to her. right, yeah. exactly. It was about and her then, breakup, an overweight gal who worked at a, 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 a she was a newspaper. journalist or whatever newspaper, right. and she all, got it was all, all her life. Fun. It could have been a memoir almost, but <laughs> right, exactly. And then, I mean, I realize they're different people, but the but the outlines yes. of their lives were very were lined up. Right. And but as she goes further and further into her career, her characters become more and more different from her. And you know, and occasionally she comes back and pulls from personal experience. But but she does. She's stretched. You know, she's now stretches herself in all sorts of different kinds of ways. And I think it's. I don't think that in any way. The values, or or in any way, cheapens her original work. I mean, I think that you can write a really powerful, wonderful, incredible fictional piece that has characters that are similar to you in one way or the other, or many ways. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, and we all have, and, you know, everybody has a story and interesting lives and things that we've gone through. Exactly. So why not use that? You know, it would just be exactly. a shame to throw it away. Exactly. I just don't think that people should always feel confined to that as they continue to go forward right. so yeah so yeah so I've um, so now I have the best of both worlds because you know I do um, I you know I had said we had talked about self-publishing I still see the value in self-publishing for certain genres and I do see that with Sophie if I write another I do plan on writing another Sophie and I do think that for me for that series, mm -hmm. it makes more sense for me to self-publish. But I do want to warn people before they rush out to do this that that series has an existing audience, yes. and that's 
very helpful. <laughs> I don't think I would do it yeah. otherwise. But but, um, but uh, the publishing world has changed so much. It's it's I, I think I read eight million uh, books are on Amazon, and uh, a, a book is published every five minutes or a hundred books or something. It's it's insane. Over, and so instead of waiting, I mean, wouldn't you say uh, to get a pub to try to get a publishing deal, which is so difficult. It's like trying to get a movie. You know, if you're an actor. Uh, to to do yeah. self publish, but if you if you're that kind of person that can promote, that can create a platform, and that can do it, yes, you know. yeah, I do actually. Because what I've seen at Simon and Schuster is a lot of the more successful authors came from self publishing, and the reason that Simon and Schuster picked them up was not because they sent them in a proposal, but because they saw they were selling well as self published right. authors. And now you've got to so, have how many? They're going to say, "Oh, how many Facebook followers? How many Twitter followers? What's your platform? Are you speaking? How many YouTube followers?" What they're going to want to know that. And a, a New York uh, agent that spoke at a conference I went to recently said, "I won't even, I won't even look at anybody unless they have at least ten thousand uh, Facebook followers or what you know these big numbers." And so to get that right. up, you've got to do that. And then if you show, I know like Teal Swan, she's one of my favorite spiritual. Uh, speakers and authors. She was selling her book by on you know just gangbusters because she had a a YouTube channel that was popular. Well, then Hay House picked her up, and I think Fifty Shades right. of Grey was Grey was self published. Tasha Ta Ta yeah, Silver. Yeah. yeah. So I think um, it, it can work yeah, if you, you work have, it. Yeah, and you just have to keep in mind publishers are risk averse. Yes. So if you can show them that this is a that this book can sell and is selling. Yeah. There's no risk for them. They can just take it and say, yeah. okay, we know this is a winner. You have proven it. And they are increasingly looking for that. And then here's so, a question, though. Here's a question. So then what if you are selling a ton on your own because you've got your a famous YouTube channel, whatever you're doing, speaking, and then why, you know, maybe you don't want a, that publishing deal because they get a big chunk, and then they own it. And, right. and I took back one of my books because I was having some blockages in, in pr movie producers wanted to do it and it was too difficult with the, the publisher so I, I uh, g got it back and now I, I have full control and uh, my next book is is the third in the series and I'm going to self-publish it because I don't want someone blocking me from doing anything so you yeah. know, it could, you'll, you'll have total control so I think there's some things to think about there too, right? It's to totally, I, first of all I think that you have to be very careful when you're um, negotiating these contracts. You yes. have to make sure that you have. I didn't have an attorney look at mine, even. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So those, so that's Live really and learn. important. Live <laughs> house. Yeah, exactly. Oh, trust me. <laughs> I've had ten years of learning, um, but, um, and I think you have to really, you have the publisher has to prove to you that they can offer you something that you cannot get on your own mm -hmm. and sometimes they can't like if you look at um, The Martian which was just made into a film right so that's um, he sold that to a publisher but he only sold the book rights not the ebook rights mm -hmm. so he still because he knows he can sell he has been selling the ebooks right, right that's right, been flying right. off of Amazon and Barnes and the rest so he doesn't need to sell those so he sold the paperback because he can't sell the paperback or get the distribution for the paperback that the publishers can. Yes. Um, okay. So the publishers, if they're going, if you're going to go to a publishing house from self-publishing, make sure they prove to you that they could do more for you than you could do for yourself. And sometimes they can't, mm -hmm. and then it's then it's okay to say no. Yeah, and that's because hard, people think that's the holy okay. grail, getting published by a ha you know a traditional publisher, which it used to be, but now we have all these options, and and you might just for the ego of it uh, screw yourself. Yeah. Exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. You don't, and that's the thing. I do think people get caught up in the ego because when you know I, I do recognize you know what I say to people now. Oh yeah, I'm published by Simon Schuster. You're like oh right. Yeah. Whereas when I say oh yeah, I self publish that book. They're like, oh, yeah. exactly, and, sure. But so, what if the because it's self published book is the one that I'm making my living on, mm -hmm. and the Simon and Schuster is the one that is being buried. Right. I'm not saying that's the case, but right. if that is the case, so what? You cannot do not. That's one of those areas where pride really can get in your way. Yeah, and you can't let it. 
And then a myth that people think automatically if you have books out there that you're rich. You know, it's it's people will are so oh. shocked to find out that I'm not making my living on my books. They're like, what? You know, uh, uh, <laughs> or I remember when my, my husband and I were looking for a house. We finally bought one four and a half years ago. But when we were looking, uh, then the, I gave the the realtor. She was this cute young gal. One of my book. I think it was Excuse Me, Your Soulmate Is Waiting. And I gave her a copy. She was single. She goes, oh, my God, I have this book. She goes, that's you? You're Marla Martinson? You're famous. And I'm like, no, I'm not. You know, you just know my the book. And she was all excited. And then the next time we met, so we met up the next week, she says, oh, Marla, I told my friend, you know, such and such, he knows who you are, too, that I'm helping Marla Martinson look for a house. And he said to her, oh, you must be looking at multi-million dollar homes. <laughs> Where in the yeah. meantime, our budget was like, you know, 325 you know what I mean? It's like, no, right. but it's so funny. And, and it's, uh, it's, so it's, it's, it's like people don't get it. It's like, cause even, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I, thanks to just one night, you know, I've had some very good years and I really have. I had some very good years, but that's not, when I say very good years, I'm not talking about Steven Spielberg years. I mean, you know, I mean, I had my son's school, you know, the, all private schools are always trying to raise money. This, that's just the way it is. And they called me in and they said, you know, we're really, we we're, want to expand. We want to build a new whatever building and such. And um, we're looking for donations and we're even willing, there's talking to me specifically, right? They go, we're even willing to consider changing the name of the school. And I look at them and I said, I don't have change the name of the school kind of money. <laughs> <laughs> what are you, like, what? I the Kira Davis wing or something. Right, like exactly. You're talking, I mean, I know what they're talking about. They're talking about, you know, millions, million, a million, a two million, right? It's like, what oh, are you talking about? Right, right. That is so funny. That is hilarious. <laughs> you know? So, yeah, and I know they just saw, you know, Kira Davis, New York Times bestseller. She's the one to hit up. And yeah, I'm like, yeah. You need to be talking to your, you know, you need to be talking to the lawyers or the doctors. You need to be talking to J.K. Rowling or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly, the plastic surgeon. Okay, she's the one who has the money. Or the, oh, right. you know, we have one of the top female professional poker players actually has her kids in the school, so they should talk to her. Yeah. Okay? okay. <laughs> great point, great point. Gosh, well, well, Kira, thank you so much for stopping by and chatting publishing and writing with us and uh, everybody I'll put her links below and if you have read any of her books and want to give us some comments put them below thanks guys thank bye. you bye <laughs>